So, Emmanuel, on Rotten Tomatoes, you're described as a raven-haired Canadian actress with a curiously mysterious history and a friendly smile. <laughs> I'll take it. I had to Google <laughs> raven-haired. Um, would you call yourself mysterious? I don't think so. Yeah. But people and even close friends of mine describe me as mysterious. Really? Which is so interesting because I think if you consider yourself to be friendly, you don't think mysterious. But it's almost like I have my core group, right, that like knows me. And then I think to a lot of other people, I'm friendly without giving too much. Mm. So it's come up a lot. So maybe a little bit. Your parents are Moroccan Jewish immigrants. Mm -hmm. You were raised in Canada. What was your upbringing like? I've heard you talk in interviews um, about being Canadian, about being Moroccan, but I haven't heard so much about your childhood. Yeah, I had um, really just a very wonderful kind of ordinary childhood. Like I grew up in a small town outside of Toronto. There was one other Jewish family. So, and my parents, they were quite practicing, even though we lived in a completely non-Jewish area. So, you know, there's always, you know, Shabbat dinner and the high holidays. And as a kid, you know, after school in the winter time, when it was time to light the Shabbat candles, I was like rushing home before like 4.15, you know, when it gets dark so early. And there was all these things, and my friends would always, you know, if there was a school dance or whatever, my friends would be like, you know, M can't come out until after that, like, Friday night thing. And then eventually I just started inviting them over, like, oh, you should come over for dinner, and we go out after. Yeah. <laughs> Growing up, and as I told you, I have an older brother and sister, and we get along great. Um, when we were young, not so much. My brother and my sister were kind of at each other quite a bit. Um, but... It was a great, it was such a lovely way to grow up in this small town. And when it was time for high school, I went to a high school for the performing arts. It was just being built. Um, so it allowed me to continue sort of my passion for acting. And, um, and then, you know, I would say the sort of main point was, unfortunately, my mom was sick for a lot of my growing up. So she, so by the time I was 11, she'd already had like several cancers. And then she, you know, passed when I was 16. So there was like a gap of time. I was sort of living two very different lives. There was like my life at school, and then there was my life as soon as I got home, which was really taking care of, you know, my sick mom. I did not know that. Mm-hmm, yeah. It was pretty intense. You, um, I was gonna bring this up later, but you're incredibly philanthropic. Um, when I was Googling, I never, I have never interviewed somebody whose Google search was so filled with philanthropy. Um, really? It, it was pretty remarkable. <laughs> there was, uh, you help women in the Congo, you're on the board of the Environmental Media Association. Mm -hmm. You talk about COVID relief during COVID, racial equality, anti-Semitism, several organizations supporting cancer research. The list, and that was just the top of the list. Mm -hmm. I was gonna ask you why you lend your voice, but now I'm thinking it's because you have all of this compassion because of your upbringing. So, uh, I, I think so. I really think that that's got to be it. Like I, wow. you know, and it's funny because I, you know, we grew up in a house, like it's so interesting as, you know, coming from a sort of very traditional Jewish home, my parents were so liberal. Um, so I didn't sort of grow up with all the stereotypes of what it is to, to, to grow up in a pretty religious home, like at all. They were very liberal. They were super into the arts. You know, in Canada, there's three parties. There's and there's NDP, which is really like the most extreme left. Which was my mom, who was a teacher. Um, you know, my dad was an accountant, and they were always just very um, accepting and sort of 
open-minded and I think somehow or somewhere that sort of came through and I think when you live through certain traumas like first you know my mom and then my dad he got diagnosed actually with the same cancer that my mom did no. colorectal cancer but then it was he had the whole colon thing and he passed away from it like nine years ago like ten years ago wow. and so I think that when you sort of live with that and at the same time just feel like so incredibly blessed I think that you just end up finding ways to give back also to if I'm going to be really honest, when I was doing Entourage, it was like, I would say pretty much at the height of Entourage, mm -hmm. where I could sort of objectively be like, oh, okay, I'm living my dream. Like, I'm on a hit show, this is popping off, this is all happening, great opportunities are coming. And I remember just feeling like, so, uh, the feeling was, this can't be it this can't be all of it like this this is this was my biggest dream so now that I'm here how come I'm feeling so unfulfilled Wow yeah and I think you know because being an actor or being in the arts you are your product right so you're it's constantly a world of like me 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 understandably like it has to be you are the product but at a certain point it was like it just wasn't enough like I felt deeply sort of depressed and unfulfilled and I just didn't feel good and it was at that moment um, that I had met John Prendergast who sort of introduced me to I heard him speak and that's where I got involved with like women in the Congo and learning all these things from you know across the world what's happening to women and I don't know, it just somehow gave me like something else and then it kind of just wet my palate for activism. And I guess I'm just, really, I consider myself to be an actor and an activist to things that I'm passionate about. You really live it. There's also um, like a Jewish principle to kun olam yes. that I kept thinking about as I was reading about you. Mm. It's like, for anybody who doesn't know, it's heal the world. Yeah. Um, and you kind of try every day to do as much as you can. Try, I try to do my part. Yeah. And sometimes I'm much lazier than others. It looks good written down, but like in my daily, I, there's certainly more I could do, but at least I'm doing something. So I'm about to ask you a question that I'm trying to work out in my own life, in my own mind. Okay. You were on Jimmy Kimmel and he said, uh, Manuel, so you're Moroccan, you're Canadian, and you said, I'm French, Jewish, Moroccan, and Canadian. Mm -hmm. I think to the average person, they wouldn't have thought of, like they would have just moved on. Yeah. I thought, this is so interesting that she made it a point on a very public stage to say, I'm also Jewish. Mm -hmm. And Lately, I have been trying to work out some of my own kind of inner stuff. Um, I have not often publicly said that I am Jewish. Mm -hmm. And it's such an important part of who I am. Mm -hmm. Why have you always made it a point to publicly talk about your Jewish identity? That is so interesting. Because back at Jimmy Kimmel, I wasn't really overtly being like I'm Jewish no. I think I think okay so so it's a okay so it's a two-part answer yeah so the first part as it pertains to Jimmy Kimmel I think what's really interesting is that when you know you say that you're Moroccan it's North Africa yeah and 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 so if I were just to say I'm Moroccan someone might assume that I'm Arabic or that I'm Muslim and so when you say that you're French Moroccan or Spanish Moroccan, you can assume that you're Jewish. Now, not everybody knows that, but to me it was always a distinction, especially when it's a, a predominantly Arab mm. country, right? So, and that I think was just because I heard it growing up all the time, so I, to, if anybody asks, I'm like, yeah, I'm a French Jewish Moroccan. Like, that's what it is. Right. Um, as far as 
now being quite out there with the fact that I'm Jewish is I think uh, having lost both of my parents and growing up in a way where Judaism, Judaism was so important to them and not in such the religious sense but just as an identity like it was just a Jewish home it was the food it was the holidays it was family there was like a real connection it's such a massive part of who I am mm -hmm. and so in addition to like this fury of anti-semitism that's going on around the world I just felt like okay now it's time to really speak up I feel like I speak up for everybody else mm -hmm. and now it's time to speak up for my people I feel the same way mm -hmm. and it's something that I find so hard to do mm -hmm. it's so interesting why is it hard for you that's what I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. I know that seeing people like you has helped me a lot and I I don't just say that because you're sitting on this couch. Listen, I understand 100% what you're yeah. saying. And I think that when you're raised sort of in that way, it's something that you carry with you. Yeah. Do you know, like you just, you do until you're ready to shed it. But sort of picking those moments where it's important to sort of to speak up because I mm -hmm. feel like we are so much more than those definitions. Yeah. But but there is also a pride of what we are. And I think it's just like finding that balance that's comfortable for you. Yeah. Do you know, I think. I really appreciate uh, your being so vocal. Thank you. So that thank you. a lot. Thank yeah. you. You've definitely informed how I hope to proceed. Great. <laughs> I love that. Uh, so I read, let's get back to acting. I read yeah. that your brother mm -hmm. paid for your acting classes yep. when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. First of all, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, have you paid him back? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think I've paid him back in, in, in certain ways. You I took mean, him to a cool premiere. Or yeah. Something. Oh, many. Yeah. Um, many. I whenever I can like spoil my my brother and my sister in like whatever perks come my way, I definitely do. But beautiful. you know, listen, there's a, a a constant gratitude besides him paying for my acting classes, you know, my brother and my sister have just been so incredibly supportive of me from the beginning. And my brother in particular, he just always felt like this was what I was destined to do. He just was like, no, this is it. And you know, when I dropped out of college, you know, my dad was freaking out. Like he was so unhappy and he was just like, does she know what she's doing and da da da. And my brother was like, she does. She felt her. it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I know. I have a really good big brother and a great big sister, too. We're really lucky. What inspired acting in the beginning? So, you know, I was that kid, like young, young, like three, four, that was a ham, you know, at the at any function, a wedding, a bar mitzvah, whatever, I'm like dancing and there's a circle around me. And as a kid, super young, there was always like little, you know, commercial agents that was like, ah, oh, she should be in tele on TV and blah, 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 blah. And then, and that was like one thing. It was like, oh, okay, cute kid. And then um, I had the opportunity to audition for a play at the local theater company in Unionville where I grew up. And I, got the part and it was a part of the baby ghost and it was my first <laughs> I know I was the baby ghost I, I hope you use the ghost emoji in <laughs> I should yeah um, it was my first play and it was like being a part of this community mm -hmm. like uh, it was like a drug I was like oh my god I have found it like I'm in and I remember I came home and I said to my dad, like, okay, hey, you gotta drive me to rehearsals. Like, this is what it's gonna be. And I kind of never looked back. And funny enough, my mom, she used to say that I would become an actress for the both of us. She could be the character in a novel. Like, if you were to write this woman, you'd just be like, there's no way that's real. That's like, just, oh. in what way? She was the most passionate, 
fiery, coquettish, beautiful, wild. Nobody gave me a hard time when I was like, this is what I want to do. I love that you're living it out for the two of you because it's, it's sort of a legacy. Yeah. 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 Especially when the going gets tough. <laughs> it's something to hold on to for mm -hmm. sure. Um, you have the cutest headshot online from when you were seven and you look the exact same. It is so wild. Yeah. Like your face is the exact same as it's your so seven-year-old face with those big brown eyes and the long eyelashes. Yeah, yeah. It's so cute oh to see. Oh my God, thank you. It really it's is. embarrassing, but No, yeah. it's not. Um, what would you consider your first big break? Like I would say my first, first big break was um, a television show in high school that I auditioned for it was a writing competition for it's the equivalent of Nickelodeon in Canada is called YTV okay so YTV was doing this writing competition and the the winner would get their pilot produced and they ended up casting from our theater department and our high school because our high school looked like a mall like it was very you know beautiful whatever so I auditioned for that and like got the part of you know, the popular girl, Roxanne Donovan, and everybody else thought that this other girl in school was gonna get it. I got it, it was a big deal. You're the underdog. I was the underdog. But it was so interesting because that's how I got my first agent. Mm. You know, so like, so that was like the first break. And then, you know, there was just hustle, hustle, hustle. There was um, a, an absolute I'm quitting the business in my early 20s I was like no. yeah I was like I'm done I don't want to do this the instability the instability the negativity the pressure the I was like I'm not cut out for this it's like really not cut out for what this. were you gonna what were the options going through your mind there actually wasn't even an option I just ended up like taking a hiatus yeah and I ended up practicing like martial arts and I was seeing this therapist, this is incredible, I was seeing this therapist in Toronto who, whose specialty was working with performers. Cool. That was her thing. And I had gone to see her and we worked together for a long, long time and I went to her being like, I think I want to quit, this has been like my dream forever, but I don't think I want to do this anymore, I really, I think I'm done. And at the end of our, you know, time together, she was like, well, hate to tell you, but uh, I really think that you need to continue doing this. <laughs> I was like, what? What do you mean? $3,000 in 16 you, sessions later. <laughs> so I ended up taking your advice, and then, funny enough, the next big break, this is, this is all part of the journey, was um, my brother had moved to Vancouver, and so I had spent some time in Vancouver, and there's a big industry in Vancouver, and I had an agent in Vancouver, and the, my first audition back was Snow Day, which is, you know, it was a huge Paramount hit, and that sort of catapulted me to coming to the States. And then, like, you know, being in the States, doing things, blah, 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 the next big break was Entourage, which was, like, two thousand and five I think you became a sex symbol overnight it was wild wild <laughs> like I feel like one day you must have gone to sleep being the Emmanuel that everybody from high school knew that your family yeah. knew and you woke up and like every magazine was calling like you had a real life switch it was strange it's weird though because you know when you're in it you don't see it that way right. and maybe that's because you're you know when you're like goal oriented like and also too as an actor especially when you're like a trained actor the last thing that you ever want is to be just a pretty face right like so you're actively working against that you know and i just was like not interested i was like this is a slippery slope I'm an actor and like there was so many press stuff that I had turned down because I was like nope this is not what Kate Winslet would do. <laughs> I was in very hindsight, serious. I was in very hindsight serious. how do you feel about that? Um, I don't I don't think it would have mattered. Yeah. I mean I love that I definitely have convictions. 
I think is great. But in hindsight, it probably wouldn't have been a bad thing to just kind of, you know, let it do what it's going to do. Like, it didn't matter. In my head, it just, like, if I was going to do the cover of Maxim, I was just going to be known as that girl. And I was like, I'm never going to do that. Yeah. And then, like, really, it wouldn't have mattered, you know? But so, so anyway, so it sort of, like, happened. Because, you know, I joined second season. And then the creator of the show, Doug, he was just so amazing and he was so invested in the relationship of Ian Sloan. And then like sort of over the course of the next couple of years, like it just started sort of like happening where Doug had created this character that men in particular were like obsessed with. They were just like, that's what I want my wife to be. Well, women wanted to be you and men wanted to date this character. It's the weirdest thing. I wonder what it was. I think if I, I think it was how easygoing she was. Really? Uh huh. Because she would do like whatever. Like she'd be like you would be like. But hey. you didn't push her around. No, but she was still like game. Right. She could hang with the boys. She could hang with the boys. She could do like she could go out. She could party. She could be nasty. She could be all the things, and still like be like very together. Mm -hmm. And and you know had her like thing going on. Right. But you know, it was such a, like, we used to joke all the time. I was like, Doug, who is this woman? <laughs> like, she, doesn't, she does not exist, let me tell you. She was like unflappable. And like, I'm sorry, there's no woman I know that is unflappable. <laughs> it's true. You're right. There was an element of like the cool. Yeah. 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 I, w I wonder if he modeled it after like this ideal he had in his mind that didn't exist. I mean, he must have. I'm going to see him after this, so I'll ask him. That's funny. I'll be like, by the way, who was she to you? <laughs> Truly, I would love to know. Yeah, I'll let you know. <laughs> and then you're living your life in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. The show was about that, but still so meta. Mm -hmm. It was so interesting. Did the scripts ever reflect your reality at all? Rarely mine. Yeah. No, I, I was just along for the ride. Uh, there were some crazy storylines where a couple of times I was like, Doug, this cannot be real. He was like, oh, you have no idea how real this is. I was like, what? Um, but no, I would say, I would say like for the guys, probably much more so, for sure. You know, for me, I, w I really, I was like just on a ride. Like every day was just so, Every day at work was this like moment of just like, wow, this is the most fun ever. It seemed like a lot of fun. It was the most fun. In 2018, you were quoted saying, there shouldn't be any shame about how we shot that show. All that is real and still exists in Hollywood. Do you still feel that way? A thousand percent. Yeah. A million. I would double down on it. I think that we've become so PC. Yeah. And, you know, there was the Me Too movement, everything, which it was necessary and had to happen. It doesn't mean that all those gnarly things don't happen. That's and shining a light on those helps change it. I think so. But, you know, when people have an opinion about something and they use these words like misogynistic and, you know, da 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 da, da they just, they, they sort of hang their hat on that. And I think that that's not so accurate. Like mm -hmm. the show, sure, it could absolutely come across as misogynistic, not because uh, the creator of the show or whoever's involved wants to make a misogynistic show. It was like, we are showing a slice of life, an actual reality that is called Hollywood. And it is so gnarly. And I mean, if you think about it, like, this is like just a tangent, but like, if you just think about the music business, like if our show had taken place in the music business, like, could you imagine? No. It would, no. It would be endless. It would probably, people would be like, no, we can't even play that on television. I mean, it, it's, it's like hilarious to me that people get so precious about it mm -hmm. because I'm just like, well, clearly then, you a are not close to people in Hollywood or haven't lived in Hollywood because sorry to tell you but there's a lot of shit that goes down a lot a lot mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'm not even privy to most of it and I hear stories. So yeah. is there something that you used to put up with that you would never put up with now? I think it's less about uh, putting up and more about how I present myself. Like now I refuse to go in if I don't feel ready. I just won't go in. And be like, why am I gonna do this to myself? Like, you know, uh, thank God I, I've been working this entire time. You know, people know who I am, like within the business, people know who I am. It matters, like if I'm gonna go in and tank, they're gonna remember that more than the girl they don't know that came in and tanked. And so, it's just sort of known with my team, with everything. A, I, I don't have a photographic memory. I really need time to work on my stuff. I can't have 10 pages the night before and then go in. Like it just, it won't happen. So that's, in that way, I just am like, no. <laughs> like, period, full stop, won't do it. Knowing yourself yeah. is uh, something that only comes with time. Mm -hmm. So Very that's it, like you know that you don't want to feel rushed and memorize 10 yes. pages. Was there a moment after Entourage that you felt like you could take a breath because acting in particular, it's this, like you said, you're the grind. product. So it's such, a, the gr grind is the word. You're always on. And you're trying to get to the next thing so that you can get to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And Entourage happens, people really know your name. They know who you are. Did you feel like you could take a breath mm -hmm. or it, no? It was go time. It was go time. It was almost even harder when Entourage was over because, because Sloan had hit in such a way, it was like people wanted that. And I was like, oh, hell no. I mean, I loved playing Sloan and I would do it again. If there was a reboot, I'd happily, do that again but when the show was done i was like oh no 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 uh -uh. there's so much more to be done here and so it was hard so there was a lot of no's when i first finished entourage and it was so scary. hard to say no it's awful it's awful like it's necessary it's so funny kevin connelly who played e he once told me we don't we have a, a joke because i he always says that he should take 5%. Because <laughs> whenever I have like anything I'm calling him, I'm like, ah, what do you think about this? And he, he had said to me, he was like, you just need to remember that no is the most powerful word in Hollywood. And I was just like, Ugh. I think that's true. I don't know, you know, uh, listen, I don't know what that means as far as like the scope of my career, but I do know that the year after Entourage, I had to say no to so many things where people just really wanted Sloan. Like that's what they were after. Um, and that was hard, but then I kind of broke that. Um, ironically, I think with The Mentalist. Interesting. Yeah. I think you're right. Yeah. It was like this awesome, yeah. like psychotic, like crazy, cool, passionate, action-y opportunity. Right, because you did the Zohan. Yeah. But it was That still, was during. Oh, it was during. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Which was so fun. Oh, yeah. I mean, needless to say. Yeah, I had but done the Zohan. But it was still somewhat in that realm. A little bit, yeah. I mean, I think that the, the reality is that when you're a certain age, yeah. especially then, I was like in my 30s, when you're a certain age and you look a certain way, there is the, I've just got to stay on this train for a while. But within that, yeah. I can make like fun choices. Like the opportunity to work opposite Adam Sandler and the other extraordinary mm -hmm. comedians, like actors. I mean, the fact that John Turturro was my brother, I still can't, even, <laughs> I'm obsessed with him. I, I cannot handle it. Um, 
you know, but but just, you know, that was just so fun. Like, so then you find the challenges like within that. Mm -hmm. It was like, whoa, getting to get your real comedy chops on with Adam Sandler, working on an accent, you know, getting to play Palestinian. That was a hard accent. It was, it's, it's a tough accent. Yeah, it's not obvious at all. Uh -uh. But it was so much fun. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so we just have some fun rapid fire questions. Okay. I like rapid fire. Okay, what's something you've discovered about yourself recently that shocked or impressed you? So, and something that impressed me. Yeah, something that impressed you about yourself. About myself. Is that um, I am resilient. Mm -hmm. Like, for real, I learned that. Can I actually ask you a question about that? Yeah. You said your dad passed nine years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, as you said, that, that your career was exploding. Mm -hmm. So you're having this thing that you've always wanted, and then one of the worst things in the world happens. Mm -hmm. How did you reconcile your life? I think he just. keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the, the, the blessing was that when my dad was very sick, I got to um, spend many months with him in Toronto. So I was there and I was living with him for a long time and I was you know, able to take care of him. We were able to talk a lot and be together. I pulled out of the film because I just wanted to be home. And I think too, he had seen so much of my success that it was almost just like, is Jeff, you know, to me, my father was simply one of the most incredible humans on the planet Earth, for real. And so there is just that thing of like, I'm just gonna keep going and just keep making him proud because that's just what he would have wanted. So I don't even think there was such a conscious like reconciling. It was just like, okay, that happened and this is continuing. And it's and sometimes it's a blessing because you know it's such a great distraction to be busy and other times you're just like, oh God, I need a breath. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just life. Yeah, you just one foot in front of the and other. That's it, a one day at a time. What TV shows on TV right now that you'd wanna be in? Oh my God. G Right, right now, I'll tell you, in the last year, Mare of Easttown. I haven't seen it. You must. Okay. It was phenomenal. Um, Mare of Easttown, uh, the one with John Turturro, um, and Adam Scott. It was, it's Severance. I also haven't seen oh that. Oh my God. And I love TV. I can't believe you're stumping me. Oh my God. Severance, Mare of Easttown, oh, The Morning Show. Euphoria. She would be so good in that. Oh, can we? A I'm gonna dream. hold that for you. Yes, I'm gonna hold that vision go, for go you. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, what is the best advice you've gotten along the way? Um, my high school prof this was mm -hmm. a game changer. Also part of my trauma, probably like later in life. He was just like. You can't get by with just being cute. And that's just like here all the time. That's in me. Yeah. From your parents too though. I don't even know. Uh, maybe. It seems like it. We were put to work. <laughs> like we were like at, the, at home, we were put to work. Like we could I mean I can clean better than anybody. I can clean vegetables, I can clean the house, I can, I mean, we were put to work. So we're definitely like a very grounded bunch. Okay. <laughs> Is there a book that you've read that you think everybody should read? Yes. The Alchemist, Siddhartha, um, a novel, Under the Banner of Heaven, mm -hmm. Those are good ones. I haven't read the last one. One of the best novels. Okay. Yeah. We have a, a question everything card deck. Okay, I love this. So feel free to pick which 
whichever just one sticks, whichever yeah, one whatever sticks, sticks out, out to me. Okay, okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. This is interesting because I asked you this. Oh. What is the best? I always think people pick the cards that they're meant to choose. What's the best advice someone has given you, and how about the worst? Oh my God, and how about the worst? Well, you know, part two of the best advice, mm -hmm. like, you know when people say, like, what do you wish your younger self had known? Yeah. I swear to God, just relax, because everything is gonna be okay. I mean, it sounds so basic, but like the level of stress and anxiety and crying and can't eat because you're sick to your stomach because of whatever the hell's going on in your life. It's like, oh my God, if I could just take that all back and just be like, it's all gonna be okay. It seems to be the plague of a woman. Like, I don't hear, when I interview men, they don't talk about that. Right. Every woman in her 20s and 30s oh, yeah. talks about that. Oh, yeah. It's real. I live it. Oh, I know. And it's like, it's such a good reminder because it's like that thing, like, it's almost, it's the most cliche, but which is when they say, like, like, every day, if you can just spend time just practicing being in the moment, mm -hmm. there's just nothing more true. And the thing is, the irony is that, like, even in my work, like, sometimes when I'm, say, for example, like, I'm doing a scene and I'm just not feeling it, or I'm just, like, I'm not connecting to it. I'm just, sometimes, you know, whatever, sometimes things are off. So I'm just like, stop. Just stop. And just, like, what is happening right now? Okay, now just be in that moment. Like, shut out the noise, shut it all out, and just like be in the moment. And it's like, boy, it's required as an actor, as a human, mm -hmm. as a friend, as a partner. It's just everything is about that, I feel like. It's amazing that you're in touch with that. I was in yoga and the teacher said last weekend, you've never lived through this moment before. So wow, simple. I know. But so profound. So profound. Yeah, I agree. I ask everybody, this is the last question, okay. the smartest decision you've ever made. I dropped out of college. It proved to okay. Terrifying. <laughs> Terrifying. Best decision I ever made. You have uh, an incredibly unique combination. It was cool to feel in person. Thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. You're thank amazing. You. That was so Thanks. fun. That was so, you're so <laughs> easy to talk to. Thank yes, you for that. Thank you. <laughs> awesome.